Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It is so great to have you here today. And we're talking about what some of you may find an inflammatory topic. And uh, one of the nicest, best people I know, great Christian man who just pisses everybody off of his existence for no reason. Uh, well, no, not no reason. Sometimes you definitely not no reason. Sharp. Yeah, no, sometimes you can be an, uh, an a-hole like me. I get it. There's, yeah. It's just Ryan Lindsay. There is just so much BS a person can take. <laughs> uh, yeah, that it, you don't have to make excuses for me. I, uh, I, am I won't. Who I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I feel it too. I mean, and so today we want to we want to talk about Christian nationalism because, uh, as two Christians who like, I'm definitely more right than than Ryan on a lot of things. Uh, but I appreciate his perspective, and he's helped me kind of see um, what I found to be like troubling, but didn't have the language for. Uh, and that is this strain of Christianity that is like Franklin Graham and like, why are all these people supporting Donald Trump when he's so clearly not a religious person or doesn't seem to really have like the hallmarks of a Christian person? I mean, you can't say one way or the other about anybody, but the, the fruit doesn't seem to be uh, there, um, you know, and he doesn't really seem to have an understanding of the gospel. So, you know, it's, like obviously Trump is gone, so it's not too much about Trump, but moving forward, there seems to be this war in the church that is forming. Uh, David French over at the Dispatch has written a lot about this and how Christians need to rise to the moment. It's why we did a show on mercy here because Christians can lead the way towards de-escalating the culture that we're in. And there seems to be some Christians that are hell-bent on keeping the status quo of anger towards one another. Uh, and Ryan and I, like we said, are jerks a lot of times online, but like we're, I feel continually called to treat people better and uh, online, in person. Uh, I don't know about you, Ryan, if you feel that same way, but like, I, I just, I sort of go, do other people have that? Like, is God calling other people sometimes to be nicer online because it just doesn't seem to be there? Yeah, no, I, I definitely um, am there with you. Like, I know I'm a jerk and it's one of those things where like everybody says social media is a drug and it really is like you get that moment of euphoria, like whether you're uh, owning the conservatives or owning the libs, whatever. And then immediately afterwards, it's just like shame. I feel so bad. <laughs> you know what? And you know what is so funny? People who are in the We Are Libertarians Facebook group, I have this conversation with John Ulrich weekly. <laughs> and he says the exact same thing. He's like, I feel so bad. I should, And I'm like, you should be nicer to Ryan. And then I talk to Ryan. I'm like, you should be nicer to John. John and I go to the same exact church. You know, and that's the funny thing is like three Christians who, you know, left, right and center for libertarians, like will fight with each other, be mean to each other and then feel bad about it. And it is that's sort of that drug uh, that that people feel that I just I find funny and wanted to address early on because we've had that conversation before. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, John and I have uh, we've we've cooled down some over the past yeah. couple of weeks. We're comrades now. I know I want to have a healing episode where you be <laughs> between the two of you, because I just think it's important. Like I say to both of you, like we're Christians, like we should be nicer to each other. Um, and there seems to be within Christian culture, this strain of people who like dating my girlfriend who comes from a Christian homeschooled background, you know, where left behind is essential reading. And uh, you know, she shows me these mom groups that she's in. And like the reformed pub, for instance, which I have been, I have been banned from, uh, if, because I basically started pointing out the gospel and everybody in the group got mad. And so like, she'll sit there and she'll argue with these like very, um, paternalistic men in this group or women who are even more like, you're not submitting hard enough. And like, they're very pro Trump and, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just like hard to look at the last year and go, all right, this person on my Facebook feed or these people in these Christian groups that she shows me, like they were 
okay with Kyle Rittenhouse. They were okay with the death of Aubrey and George Floyd for the most part. They were okay with Donald Trump using the 82nd Airborne on protesters. They bought into the the big lie about the the end of the uh, election. They bought into, Mm -hmm. they were okay with the Capitol insurrection. And at a certain point, I start looking at these Christians and go, why don't you see what I see? Like, why don't you look at Donald Trump using our symbols to gas protesters to go cynically try to pose in front of a church as a problem? And I, I, I'm having a hard time figuring that out. I mean, and you said it's Christian nationalism. What is it and how does that relate to some of the, the people that I think a lot of Christians and, and people like us are struggling watching? Yeah. Um, and first off, just a disclaimer, like be, we are talking about a very large group of people and like a large religion. So there's going to be some generalities made. Um, that's I don't mean to like offend anybody. I know this doesn't apply to everybody. I just want to get that out of the way first. Um, and then also like this is a lot like you, like this is the world I grew up in. So I'm not just like looking as an outsider in at it. Like I like these are my people. Um, I grew know, up in Missouri in the Ozark, yeah, right? in the Southern Baptist Church. Like I I know that these people intimately intimately. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just a couple disclaimers there. And then so I think it's really important to understand because uh like for one thing i don't think you can really understand um a lot of the current moment what's going on with the more uh far right elements of america without understanding christian nationalism so this isn't something that uh, just christians should be concerned about um but at the same time i think it's something that especially christians should be concerned about because i think it's really easy you know to um to look at like the people who are waving their Jesus signs and storming the Capitol um, to look at them and say like, Oh, those aren't real Christians. Like they're like, I, they're over there. I'm over here. Uh, I don't, but I don't think we can do that. Like they are Christians. They're a part of our religion. Like, and if we're, if Christians are honest, like the entire religion has a pretty uh, bloated history of, think like incidents like that of christian nationalism and such um so yeah, it's the crusades using yeah. christianity to support slavery mm-hmm. using it to support jim crow yeah yeah so it would be nice to be able to use that excuse they're not real christians but they are and so that's why christians like us like we have to be concerned about this and address it um and i i, I think you hit on a really good point talking about the left behind books um i i think a lot of people outside of the Christian world don't understand how incredibly powerful Christian media is. Um, Like it doesn't really reach a lot of people outside of that silo, but in that silo, it is like an all pervasive force. Um, When when I converted to Christianity at 18, I didn't watch or read anything out of that bubble or listen to anything out of that bubble until 2005. Yeah. So from 2002 to 2005 or six, like when I started watching the news again or listening to regular radio or reading books, like I, I realized how much of in that bubble I was because there is the idea that we, it's the Benedict option. We should be mm-hmm. set apart. We should set ourselves apart with other Christians. We should, we should not engage in the world in worldly man. Like, I think it is it is something that non-Christians may not totally understand the influence that a lot of these radio pastors have or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, podcasts, you know, like the Stephen Furtick podcast is at tops and, you know, Tony, it, it, that's why it's sort of crazy to watch people like Ravi Zacharias or James McDonald and some of these people fall in the way yeah. that they have because they, it's a big deal to Christians because they hold so much power and to find out that they're so human is mm-hmm. in human in bad ways often uh are it it's it's sort of shaking for people like you saw it with ted haggard and and you know it's it it, it sort of shakes these people in a way that they go i can't even really trust Ravi zacharias who's accused of like molestation basically like really horrible things i, I think uh, unwanted touching of adult women is the better way to put it yeah. um so you know, and this is a guy that was super well-respected, that was, you know, 
not didn't seem weird, right? Or they see Franklin Graham, I mean, Billy Graham's son supporting Donald Trump and all these pastors. And then you've got people prophesying that Donald Trump's going to win all these elections. And really what it comes down to, I think, is there is a long strain in Christianity. You know, Truman established Israel to help speed up the end times. Mm -hmm. The end times like one of the fears of these folks is that Joe Biden will turn on Israel and that will prevent the end times from being ushered in as opposed to like looking at the worldly solution of politics as opposed to going God's timing is God's timing and humans are irrelevant, you know? And so there was like this huge freak out, right? And I'm sure you saw it that when Joe Biden took over that day, <laughs> they updated the Twitter for the Israeli embassy yeah. to include the West Bank of Gaza. And like, I saw every Christian group that I'm in explode with fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that too. Um, yeah. And that's, there definitely is like uh, a lot of a huge fascination, almost just like a fetish with like end times prophecy and uh, politics surrounding Israel in these circles. Um, oh, to the extent, like there's people who like, fervently just pray for the world to end like every day like they just want <laughs> like the book of revelation to come true literally like right now and um and that's like a, and they're trying to force that through politics these christian nationalists are and that's a really scary um a really scary thing to do because if you look at if you take the book of liter book of revelation literally uh you're looking at billions of people dying um and they're trying to like make this happen and speed it along through politics um it, and yeah it's it's just a disaster waiting to happen and that leads to all kinds of uh just conspiracy theories and stuff i think really opens them up to that um just conspiracy theories in general because well like uh those books that came out you know a few decades ago about like 88 reasons why jesus is coming in 88 and stuff just these people like spend just their entire lives pouring through like taking clues out of nowhere and saying like oh look i found a hundred reasons like to point to why this exact day is when jesus is going to return and then they start applying that same kind of thinking and like ill logic to everything else like they will go through donald trump's tweets and it's like oh if you rearrange the letters this way it actually says this message where they're just taking these totally crazy conjectures out of everything um and i think a lot of it stems because of their theology the way they look at the bible and interpret uh prophecy um and then whenever that spreads to like their politics then it just becomes cancer yeah there's a and actually he just passed away his name was urban baxter uh he died at 75 and he was uh it started in richmond indiana and so that's how i always heard it on the radio <laughs> and went to Plano, Texas, but it was, he had end time ministries mm. and uh, teacher of biblical prophecy. And it was based in Texas. And it basically was on all kinds of different radio shows. Like, yeah, let me see if this organization is still around, but you know, he would take people to um, the, the it, it, there's all kinds of tours that you can take uh, to Israel uh, and you can, like see where I would encourage people to read the left behind stuff because I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of it was actually really good. Like there was a great, uh, uh, like they put together like a, um, like the uh, tribulation uh, squad or no, no, no it was, a, it, it's several different books, but they read really well, but there was a sound drama, like an old time radio show about it. And oh. it was, it was gripping and great. And it gives you a lot of, uh, insight into the stuff The endtime.com e-n-d-t-i-m-e.com i mean this guy was the the king of taking and they still do shows of taking end time prophecies and applying it and you know like israel was always i mean it's really helps you kind of explain what's going on and there is uh it's just really important to kind of understand how important israel and the end times are in this context mm -hmm. Um, but let's give a definition of Christian nationalism and how is it different maybe from just like regular evangelical Christianity or are they one and the same at this point? Yeah, so I would say Christian nationalism is uh, it's essentially 
like if you can understand nationalism then you can understand christian nationalism but with the understanding that it's um there's a central role i'm trying to think okay so for example i'm just gonna go straight to the nazi example um you could be a good nazi you could be a good brown shirt without being like a christian person and pious and all that um except for in christian nationalism like the christianity and the piety is like the the key focus of it it's obedience Um, to the state yes it's trying to build the the kingdom of god um on earth but through force and through the state and through laws and everything um essentially saying that uh you know there's all these communists and satanists and pedophiles out there and they need to be put down essentially um we need to build a theocratic christian nation on on uh you know on earth right here and there's there's obviously again not everybody but there is a huge um white supremacist element to christian nationalism as well um the like if you and if you don't believe me just google uh not on a work computer probably but google christian identity um and see what comes up like that's one of those things that's kind of for a long time uh been a dog whistle for white identity um like all during the civil rights era and all another Um, one is kenism uh which is a white nationalist interpretation of christianity and so it's anti-immigrant southern heritage separatists this is from wikipedia Mm -hmm. who splintered off from christian reconstructionism to advocate the belief that God's intended order is loving one's kind by separating people along tribal and ethnic lines to live in large extended family groups. And I've run in um, some of the Kenanists were associated with the Neo-Confederate League of the South, which had a lot of libertarians in it. And uh, uh, they're, uh, and they stated that the non-white immigration invasion is the final solution to the white problem with the South. So white race genocide. So they're coming to replace you, which remember in Charlottesville, all those guys with tiki torches were marching saying they will not replace us. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about replacement replacement theory, I guess you maybe you'd call it, and, and how that, like, Again, not every Christian is a white nationalist or a Christian nationalist. And if you have a flag in a Bible, you're not, a, that's not what we're saying. Like we're saying the, the more extreme elements preach this stuff and then it kind of will bleed and people will unintentionally, Lenin called them useful idiots. You know, they're people who the coalitional instinct kicks in and they say, well, this is one of my own, quit being mean to them. Um, and that's what dog whistles or virtue signaling are right like it's it's using language that you may not know that like certain phrases have unintentional meanings but it's you're you're softening the ground for future action right so you know what is they will not replace us because this is a really like this is a very important idea to understand that when you understand it you start to see it being spread in the ideas the victimology of the right by people that have that are functionally not white supremacists but they grab onto those ideas and kind of push that victimology which like ryan as a leftist is coming to invade your suburban town and cory booker (laughs) will be there tomorrow and they're going to make you uh you know kneel before a black person and apologize for your whiteness and then they're going to take your job you know, how does that, how does that fit into the replacement theory that Kenanists use? Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely a, uh, a big part of Christian nationalism is looking at America's past and like idealizing it, um, saying like, oh, America, you know, used to be this great shining city on a hill. Um, and we're not anymore. Um, and obviously they think that's a problem. Um, and so then they try to address, well, why aren't we this shining city on a hill before? And a lot of the time it boils down to what they're going to say is uh, these alleged socialists and atheists and communists. Um, and they always lump those three together. And uh, <laughs> those people, they're trying to take 
America over and ruin it. They're anti-God, they're anti-Christ. Um, and the where the nationalism part of it really kicks in is it's saying America was a Christian nation. These people are trying to make it not a Christian nation, and it's your God-ordained mission to stop it, um, to make America great again, for example. Um, you need to stand up for America from the olden times, and every single person in Christianity has a role to play in that. Um, you know, whether you're wearing a nice three-piece suit like Josh Hawley, or if you're wearing a Buffalo Viking costume, like you have a role to play in this, and you're conditioned to just think that pre and again this is where the white nationalism part comes in it's always like america pre 1960s was great you know before integration um america was amazing and perfect like you'll hear um oh like whenever when they took god out of the schools america went to hell in a handbasket and when that rhetoric really started to uh be a normal phrase in christian circles uh, that was during the 1960s when integration was starting to happen. Um, and so it was just kind of a convenient cover. And that's, uh, you you said it, uh, useful idiots. That's, it's a, it was a convenient cover for segregationists to attacks integrating schools. And they knew, you know, I probably can't get Christians like in mass to be like, oh, black people shouldn't be in schools, but I can make them hate the schools by making them believe that schools are teaching atheism and secularism so they make up these these lies like oh they're kicking god out of school so now you have christians attacking school and essentially being useful idiots for the segregationist um that's an example from like that time period and it, it kind of goes uh it keep it keeps going forward like you could say with well, but let me let, let me give one example so the 20s clan here in indiana the 20s clan in indiana had a third of the state in their membership roles and they were big on Amer I mean, america first was their slogan they were anti-immigrant and anti-catholic they there weren't many mm -hmm. blacks or jews here in indiana at the time but there were a lot of catholics who were first or second generation catholics and so the concern was we don't want to have to compete with these people and well what's one way to attack the the catholic to make them less catholic and more american aka protestant we need to start a war on Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the 20s clan in Indiana, uh, James H. Madison just wrote a great book on it. Uh, highly recommend it. He's a professor at IU. They, the, one of their missions was separation of church and state uh, uh, and schooling. Um, so the, the, the goal was basically to keep put patriotism into schools and they institute if you have a flag in your school in your classroom in indiana it's because the clan passed a law in 1926 i think to put a flag in every classroom in indiana because they felt catholics weren't putting flags in their classroom and people needed to be reminded that this was america and their allegiance was to the flag and not to the pope who they conspiratorial thought, conspiratorially, the rumor was the Pope had a, a castle being built in Cincinnati to <laughs> take over Indiana and Ohio. And so Popism, so if you've ever heard stories about how Kennedy had to really like fight the yeah. anti-Catholic bias in 1960, it's because all those people were still voting and it was, yeah. they had had been conditioned. And so they they did everything they possibly could to end private schooling and promote public schooling to kill off catholic school systems uh because it was indirect it was the way that they were it, they were being indoctrinated with popism as they huh. called it yeah. uh so so we need obedience to the state instead of to your religion and so they really um you know that's a that's a way where a lot of people thought, oh yeah, I don't think, I don't want the government involved in, uh, I, I do think that the religion should be separated, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm trying to sugarcoat it. A third <laughs> of the state is in the Klan. Most people didn't want there to be Catholic schools. They were big, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't think people in 1920 I, I, in, in Indiana, I think we should be under no illusions that they still held white supremacist beliefs. Like, 
That's right. the ding on Lincoln. Like Lincoln held white supremacist beliefs. Most Northerners did mm -hmm. until Union soldiers went down south and saw slavery for themselves. And when they saw it for themselves, they said, what we see in the media does not reflect the reality of the, the person, who, the black person in, in slavery. Mm -hmm. And that is what single-handedly changed those letters home, started to change the attitude towards freeing slaves because abolitionists were like freaks until yeah. that started happening. Um, you know, and so these are ways in our past that some of these enabling beliefs have stuck around, that, that we can look back at the past and go, oh, isn't that quaint? But there's a lot in what we're talking about today that kind of, there's ghosts of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so. For sure. And and I think there's also a, and that this is kind of a, definitely a recurring theme, like Christian nationalism throughout history is uh, taking advantage of Christian beliefs or certain Christian theologies and manipulating people that believe those into doing these terrible perverse things or supporting these awful causes um and and i think there's definitely sorry my dogs are barking that's at okay something. yeah like immigration and not really caring that how many christians said to you well if they don't want to be separated they shouldn't come here <laughs> i mean that's a direct example from two years ago yeah yeah for sure or or i think it's definitely not as much of a problem now um but like a lot of the anti-lgbt laws um you know they they were able to like the just the far right fascists were able to get christians a lot of christians like on board with these terrible laws like oh you should take their kids away um using just, the using the state to deny people freedom to make yeah, their own choices and instead they got of, them yeah instead of persuading to, people mm -hmm. And they were able to get them to support that by like being like, oh, look, like your scripture says that this is wrong. So you have to fight it on every front available to you. Well, not um, just that. I mean, I'm a little older than you. It was marriage itself as an institution will be destroyed. And then mm -hmm. what destroyed the institution was the divorce rate. And it's even in Christian circles with I'm a Christian, I've been divorced, right? Like, you know, we destroyed marriage on our own. It wasn't yeah. the gays. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's current or not but i know as of at least like a, just a few years ago the divorce rate in evangelical churches was higher than like non-religious people so <laughs> yeah i mean so there's an example and, and as the family on netflix is a great example of christian political power even though the documentary is sort of hilarious in the way that it tries to make them look nefarious like mm -hmm. it's sort of comical how biased it is against the subjects in the documentary but mm -hmm. it does show you the the 80s and 90s mindset of the the Mike Pence's of the world and how they viewed using the state to control and manipulate people that they felt were enemies. Uh, and as libertarians, we reject using state power to force anyone to live in any way that they they don't want to live. Like you cannot force, just like the mask mandates, you can't force people to wear a mask because they're just yeah. not going to. You can only persuade them. And the more you try to force people, the more they reject the idea of wearing a mask. Uh, and it, it's it's counterproductive. So it's it, you have to apply um, these same concepts to religious uses of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so just what, this. I know you've prepared a lot of other points. So like, what are, what are some other things that we ought to be thinking about and watching for? Yeah, um, so I, I think it's interesting to uh, to try to understand like what is it about uh, like American Christianity that's almost like grooming you know thousands of people into embracing this ideology of Christian nationalism um, and uh, even just sometimes like just outright fascism like Christo fascism if you want to call it that um, and. I think uh, it's important to, I think we kind of have to realign our concepts of like nationalism and fascism and all that sort of, because I think a lot of people, you say those words and you get this mental picture of like brown shirts marching down the streets with a gun to your head, like forcing you to be a Nazi. Um, but this like Christian nationalism, it's almost more sort of like a, uh, uh, like a soft authoritarianism kind of like there's, you like, 
it's in a, a fascism and authoritarianism that you choose. Like there's this Christian Protestant logic of non-compulsion to it. Um, it's like Armenian fascism, I guess. It's not Calvinistic. Um, but, uh, and I think that's really key to understanding the ideology. Um, and it goes also back to like those Christian media echo chambers. Like once you're in that circle, like you are inevitably like, okay, so it's going to happen. Like, if you don't believe me, go to a youth camp. It's going to be Thursday night. Uh, you're looking forward to seeing your friends when you get home. And then all of a sudden there's emotional music playing and somebody telling you this could be your last chance to avoid going to hell. Next thing right. you know, you're down at the altar um, and you're a Christian. And instead of looking forward to seeing your friends, you're dreading seeing your friends or you're thinking about all the ways to proselytize to them and convert them and save them. Um, and then from there, you have two choices. You're going to either eventually read Leo Tolstoy and become a Christian anarchist, or you're going to read Jerry Falwell and become a Christian nationalist. That's right, so then you're not amplifying read it. it but. You're gonna, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, um, the it, it's networks of power, right? And it's mm -hmm. every, every human group, um, regardless of political, religious ideology, you know, people, once they have become you know, the mainline churches, Methodists, uh, Church of Christ, I mean, the, a lot of these mainline Episcopalian, they, they have, they held a lot of political power through the end of the Civil War, through the, you know, really the 60s, 70s, 80s, they held a lot of political power. And so people don't want to give up that political and religious power. And then Billy Graham comes along and starts basically the evangelical movement, and they become political power. A lot of people right now who run mega churches don't want to give up that political and uh, religious power. And now there's the more emergent church or the the you know the 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 celebrity pastor essentially. They've become kind of the the power, and it's based a lot on baptism or charismatic churches. And then they'll fall, and they won't want to give up political. And uh, now the thing about somebody like a Matt Chandler down at the village church, or, you know, frankly, my mega church on the South side of Indianapolis, Mount Pleasant Christian church, mm -hmm. they canceled their 4th of July services. And the, the church that I go to seems to be very aware of the seduction of a lot of these ideologies in Donald Trump and has taken steps to respectfully push back on the congregation and try to call people out of, um, unempathetic, hard-hearted political stances or religious stances. Uh, I've seen that in uh, the biggest church planting ministry through the Village Church and Matt Chandler do somewhat of the same and, and basically say what you just said, which is people who were frightened into converting, that is not the way to do it. We yeah. should be calling people to live a better, more empathetic life in the love of Christ. I mean, that and so there need there seems to be an awareness. Uh, there was one charismatic pastor. I sent it to you. This guy like has been up Donald Trump's behind for for a long time and prophesied that he would win. And then when he didn't win, he basically was ruined and shamed, and uh, had the humility to go, "I was wrong, and here's the reasons why, and I need to be restored so people have trust in my prophecy again." Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really important part of it. Um, is like in this moment after we've seen Trump get defeated and, and like you said, like a lot of uh, like, I don't know what word to use, like normie churches, like they're not like the, the more progressive churches um, or anything right. like that. It's just like your standard American churches, lots of them are starting to like see Christian nationalism for what it is and how it really has just infected and saturated like almost every denomination in the country um, and they're starting to push back against that which is awesome um, and I, that's going to be a huge conversation uh, going forward in Christianity is how do we like sort of redeem like our entire religion because for people outside of Christianity um, like it, it's not a good perception of the religion um, as a whole like most people like they see if like you do a word association exercise with them with Christianity 
and like within 10 words, you know, they're going to have said conservative Republican Trump, you know, greed, um, greed. Racism. Yeah. Yeah. Like all these things. So there's has to be a massive conversation of how do we like resolve that image? Um, how do we make things better? And a lot, I really like what I think it was Matt Chandler, you were pointing to said mm -hmm. something along the lines of we have to look at how we're getting people to come into the faith. We can't like be scaring people into Christianity. Um, Cause it's, again, it's not like a violent gun to the head coercion, but it is like a, a violent, like social coercion almost of like terrifying these people um, into joining your faith community. And cause then that mentality of uh, basically social coercion just carries on through, through everything this is this is what i always talk about with with the pure power state where people are wrestling for the gun of government and if i don't get it they're going to kill me you know it's the, it's the the idea that you know democrats and republicans vote out of self protection from the other side you know there's a lot of democrats who don't like joe biden that voted for joe biden because they feel that they're going to their lives are on the line if donald trump gets elected and this voice encouraging this ideology continues their lives are in danger and there's a lot of libertarians and conservatives that i see online that say you know well we're all you know this cancel culture is a sign that we're being erased from polite society if we don't have donald trump defending us then we're not going we're not going to survive we'll get we'll get killed or or lose our jobs or whatever right so it's a lot of fear and you know the 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 christian church plays a role, and I see this, in, I mean, there's a lot of parallels of what you've just talked about with the libertarian movement. You talk about, like, when I go move through the Pat Down audience, they're like, wait a minute, libertarians aren't racist? Uh, you know, I mean, there's, uh, there is a strong association with libertarianism with a lot of these ideas that we have just talked about. And so mm -hmm. there is, um, when I look at, uh, you know, I did an interview with a guy named Daniel Darling who wrote the um, the uh, Dignity Revolution. There's some things that I disagree with him on and in that book, and there's a lot that I agree on. But like he's coming at it from a point of the dignity and protection of every human, mm -hmm. no matter how small or how big or how you know non-utilitarian. Like we tend to take the Ayn Rand, and maybe you can talk about this because. We tend to view people as their worth is, uh, what's the first question you ask somebody? What do you do for a living? I need yeah. to judge your utility to this society to value your worth. And Christians take the exact opposite approach. I wanna take the marginalized person, the woman who is a freak because she's been bleeding for 30 years or a leper walking up and touching the leper mm -hmm. or the man who has the crippled hand or the man who can't walk, the lame, the blind, the sick the people that are on marginalized outside of of networks of power that have no ability to fend for themselves those are the people that christians ought to be defending and libertarians too and instead a lot of times this ideology has them protecting networks of power and and institutions that perpetuate abuse of the marginalized yeah, um, and I think so with the, the Christianity aspect of that, I think a lot of that uh, does go back to, I guess, I, I think there's a lot of connection there to like free will theology. And don't get me wrong, like I'm all about free will. Like I, I don't like Calvinism at all. I'm pure free willist. Um, but I think there is that idea of like, well, I, I, personally chose to be a Christian. I personally chose to accept Jesus. I personally individually chose to make all these choices that led to where I'm at. So I think there's this tendency to look at people who are in worse situations than us when you come from that mentality and just say like, well, why don't they choose something that will be better? And, and sometimes that is the case, you know, like if somebody is like having trouble paying rent, but they're also buying like two hundred dollars worth of cigarettes and alcohol a week then okay yeah that's a choice but it's i don't think most of the time like it's not a matter of like oh why don't they just choose to get a better job because pull yourself up by the bootstraps i mean if yeah you, 
read Miss Pat's book, Rabbit, one of the best books I've ever read. Miss Pat didn't have the chance to pull herself up by her bootstraps. It mm-hmm. took people in her life that were, had positions of privilege reaching out and saying, I see something in you. Let me help you. I see worth in you. Mm-hmm. In, in a life where most people didn't see her having worth, they said, I see worth and value in you. I'm going to help you. You know, now she's got a TV show and she's doing, you know, she's an amazing person. She didn't pull herself up by her bootstraps. She had people see her worth and dignity mm-hmm. and do things from their position to help her get to where she is. And if charity always starts at home and we're never reaching out to people who need help, then they stay in that same position. And that's sort of my, you know, the idea that, well, we have the big welfare state and so they can take care of them. I don't need to, I don't need to give charity. Charity starts at home. It's sort of like a crazy attitude and unchristian to me. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And I think that's um, a problem with, uh, you know, people on the left and the right, um, you know, the left with the welfare state, the right with charity. Um, and both of them tend to view those different institutions, welfare and charity as like, these are like our great problem solvers like this is a good end state like i want a robust welfare state that's going to take care of everybody or i want robust private charities that are going to take care of everybody but i think as christians i think our our view should be a lot more uh bigger more transformative than that um more about like we should be making a world where a welfare state or charity aren't even needed um like where nobody gets to this point of if they don't get help within two hours, they're going to be evicted, you know, Um, or this person hasn't, they like these kids didn't have uh, lunch five times this week because their parents couldn't afford to feed them. Like it shouldn't be about, well, like how do we address these problems with welfare charity? It should be, how do we move past these problems, create a world where, um, like we can stop these problems before welfare or charity are even needed. Um, how, how do you how do you do that? You know, we don't advocate for state action here. I mean, how do you get to that place? If I knew that, I would <laughs> be a best <laughs> best selling author. Uh, yeah, yeah um, and and I think a lot of it, and I think this is another kind of. Again, and I, I love Christianity. I am a Christian. I love the church, but, and th- I think that's why I'm so hard on it is, but I think that is a failing of the church. I think the church, uh, the church has a lot of roles as an institution, but I think one of those roles is, was supposed to be, well, like in the book of Acts, like they were living, like they set themselves up as an example of this can be the new economic and social and political order. Like, like this is like a reality that you can have on earth. Um, And the church is supposed to be an example of that. And by example, inviting people to become part of that new transformed reality. Um, But, and I think the church has really failed to uh, provide that example to live. In some ways, because let me push back on you because I host now hear this and I talk to a lot of charities and I go to a church that is the largest, uh, food and clothing bank on the south side of Indianapolis, 12th largest mm-hmm. city. They have three impact centers in communities that need help. Uh, they, you know, when COVID hit and parents needed to go to work, they have a classroom set up in these impact centers that, you know, adults help them with their homework while there is online learning and parents can work, you know, paid $7 million in medical bills last year. Uh, when I, when I talk to the leaders of these nonprofits, they're often Christians. They're in these roles, making a a bum salary because they are wanting to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think God's church is intimately involved in solving a lot of these peoples in private ways. It's just that that doesn't get the press nearly as much because a, they're not going to promote it because they're humble people. But then like, I've been trying to get my church on now hear this for like a year to talk about all the great stuff they do and they just don't want to do it like they're not it's they don't want to talk about it they feel that it's you know they're humble people like you know but there's millions of dollars the church is debt free and all the offerings go out to minister to the community you know Mm -hmm. it's not it's it it's like one of the best examples that we ought to promote but we don't because we get stuck 
oh well look at preacher sneakers and uh look at look at the five thousand dollar sweater that Stephen Furtick's wearing or mm -hmm. what what about Ravi Zacharias it's sort of like we have that same problem of like there's a lot of good libertarians doing a lot of good work in the LP and elsewhere but we're talking about these two podcasters fighting you know I mean I, I, so I, I think that there is a tremendous and maybe I'm just lucky because I live in a city that thrives on private institutions and limited government. Um, and which is a story that I am going to try and tell more articulately. Um, so I don't want to beat up on the church too much, but I do think that if everybody were more involved, I mean, the, the average giving is 2%, you know, mm -hmm. Christians give 2% in like there's some Barna study. Well, that's yep. not, you know, if, if they gave 10%, I think it was in the Dignity Revolution, he talked about that. He's like, imagine if God's people gave hundreds of billions of dollars more. Yeah. Or what was it in the in the book of Acts? Um, every but from each according to their ability. Uh, to no, no, that's your buddy, Mark. <laughs> you've, um, you're not going to bamboozle me with your communism. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. And yeah, and I, again, like, I am talking in generalities. There are a lot of churches out there that are doing really good things. Um, and I, I think that's kind of part of that kind of shift that we're seeing now is a lot of churches over, uh, especially over the past like four or five years with Trump um, just have been kind of confronted with like the ugliness of some of the ideologies that they've supported or tolerated and have started to like find really good meaningful ways to shift away from that. Um, and so I guess really the generalities don't work as well anymore since that shift is happening. Um, but I think, I, I still think overall, again, in general, I would, I would like to see, uh, these churches and just the church, like that concept, um, addressing these issues at a more, uh, systemic level, I guess. Um, Imagine if we took the attitude that BLM protesters and immigrants are people to help and we develop private institutions to do so, yes. as opposed to being angry at the state for, for picking up our slack or right, treating yeah. them like they're the enemy. I think it's a mindset shift that needs to take place uh, within our circles. For sure. I mean, like, and there's and I think there's always, and I'm not just talking about other people like me too. I think there always needs to be this constant uh, self-reflection and like looking for hypocrisy in your own life. You know, like, I mean, it's the easy example, but if I'm going to, uh, you know, stand up and preach that you, we should be reaching out to BLM and stuff like that, then I can't also go and like, the next minute be like oh also come by the family life center friday so we can watch the new kevin sorbo movie where he fights antifa on his farm and right you know um and so it just recognizing uh things like that and just it, again i the church i think a lot of churches are making a good shift uh but they need to be pushed to continue that i think any form of leadership comes from the people that consent to said leadership mm -hmm. you know a pastor if if a church changes then a pastor adjusts if a population changes voters change a government adjusts mm -hmm. like it you know it we gotta get away from the idea that like whatever side you're on the other side is this all-powerful borg intent on destruction and realize that we're not we didn't get a chance to talk about it today on the big show, but it's something that I want to talk about is Randolph Bourne's distinction between government and the state, you know, and he talks about yeah. how the state is this all powerful entity that wages war. And it's where people find meaning to, you know, war is a, uh, Chris Hedges wrote this book, war is a force that gives us meaning versus government where the people who are governed consent to certain things being done or not done. And, you know, there's a raucous debate about how that ought to be done. And most people mm -hmm. are checking out of that debate and checking out of getting involved in local government. Like if you think the election was stolen, you can call your county clerk right now and volunteer to be a watcher in the next election. You can volunteer to be a judge. You can volunteer to work in one of those rooms that you think shenanigans was happening. You can run for office and be a candidate on the ballot. 
you can participate in the government. A state doesn't allow that. You know, that you are, you are a functionary of this organ or you are, uh, you are an enemy of it. And so I think, you know, our shift in mentality needs to be, how can I personally, within whatever I have the ability to do, influence the people that have leadership over me mm. uh, and start to change these things. But first we must understand our principle, our first principles, our values and have our own and that's where I think individualism is important because an individual governs themselves and participates in their community. And this is the American system. What, what I think the last 60, 70, 80 years of libertarianism and its influence on the right has done through Ayn Rand and some others is we've kind of walked away from the Russell Kirk notions of community, Clinton Rossiter, and they lost that debate. Like there's a great book called Buckley uh, by Carl T. Bogus that talks a lot about how the communitarians lost the debate with the libertarians and Buckley made National Review and the right a libertarian individualist institution along with Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. There's some truth to that. Um, and I think that we have lost sight of the importance of community, Ryan. Like I think we have to be active participants in our communities. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and yeah, I think individualism has been, you know, whatever you want to call it, like hyper individualism, whatever it's been taken, I, th I think, to extremely unhealthy uh, extremes in pretty like all throughout America. Um, but there is a, an important role for it. Um, but I, I think there has to be a blend of individualism and uh, what, whatever you want, communalism or, you know, being... individualism isn't, I can do whatever the F I want without consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there should be this idea of, uh, you know, not like the state or the central organizing group, like controlling you like, oh, we like X goal is good for the community. So you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this to contribute to that goal. But on an individual level, everybody thinking like, not only what's best for me, but like individually, what can I do to help my community um, as a whole? What And even if that comes at the extent, like maybe even if it's something like as petty as, oh, I don't want to spend my Saturday afternoon volunteering, but it's good for my community. So I'm going to give up what's individually good for me and go volunteer because it helps the community. Um, and I think that's where the blend of individualism and like a uh, community ethic kind of comes into play. Every person that ends up volunteering finds out how much more beneficial it, it was than spending time watching Blacklist on Saturday. <laughs> I, I mean, it just, it, when you actually participate and volunteer and you're engaged, it's just such a, it's a blessing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think people are missing out on the opportunity to bless themselves with community and, uh, you know, being a little selfish. So, but who am I to judge, Ryan? That's what I say. Who am I to judge? Yeah. Hey, as look long the, as you look, uh, at the, look at my plank. As long as you judge yourself too, it's like the little caveat. You can say whatever you want about others, but then just say like, "Oh, but me too," and then and then you're good. Yes. Well, that's... no one judges, <laughs> no one judges me more than me. That's for sure. Except maybe never mind. Uh, anyways, uh, Ryan, final <laughs> thoughts. I mean, what else? You know, do you want to say to folks about this? Yeah. Um. And so I definitely do want to say, like, I, I made a point to emphasize, like, no, like these Christian nationalists you're seeing, like, they are Christians, like they're part of our Christian tradition and culture and everything. So we can't discount them. But at the same time, I, I want to make sure to point out, like, they are acting in very unchristian ways. Um, like just uh, so in the gospel, uh, Luke four, it says the gospel is good news to the poor. Uh, it's healing to the sick. It's liberating to the oppressed. Um, so like, that's the gospel. And if you're looking at the Christian nationalist, that ideology, it's, it's none of those things. It's definitely not good news to the poor. Uh, it's not healing to anybody and it's more oppressing than anything. Um, so I do want to make sure to point out, like, it's, it's not a, uh, there, it's not a Christian way that Christians are acting. And there's, Big, I know libertarians don't like to talk about Romans 13 a lot. It's a very contentious verse in libertarian circles um, where Paul's saying, like, 
you know, basically submit to the authorities, but it is in the Bible. So Christians have to address it. And there's nothing about what we saw on January 6th that in any way aligns with any interpretation of Romans 13. So just throwing that out there. You're um, saying theft and violence aren't Christian and legal? <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's no, not, I mean, it's... And I know that uh, you hate the the uh, bipartisan comparison, but I, I, I just think it's important for people that supported January 6th to look at it and go, you spent us... You spent all year telling us how bad Antifa is and how important property rights are, but then you're saying it is okay for these people to violate property rights and oh but it's, but it's public property it's like you either follow laws or you don't because right when, <laughs> like when it comes time for anarcho-capitalism to be enforced i want to trust that you are going to follow the the a contract that we're making with each other you know yeah. it's like we have to model and model like the world that we want to see and eventually people go oh this peaceful person isn't advocating for Rittenhouse and the 82nd Airborne and the Capitol violence and like Aubrey being killed, be, you know, it's just like people don't want to be in a world with you if you look like you're not going to uphold your end of the bargain. Right. They see yeah. you as a threat. So how can we not be a threat? And the people that we feel are a threat when re they realize that we're not a threat will start to deescalate themselves because they trust you more. Right. Yeah, and I just have one one last thing I want to say, um, and it's about it relates to January six sort of too. Um, but and I, I this kind of really kind of flew under the radar because not a lot of people really care about the traditional Christian calendar in America. Um, but so there's on that calendar, uh, January six is actually a, a holiday called Epiphany. Um, mm. Are you familiar with Epiphany? Barely. Yeah. So it's actually so it's. 12 days after Christmas, uh, and it symbolizes the time that, like, the three magi found Jesus and gave him the gifts and all. Um, and that's actually where the song uh, 12 Days of Christmas comes from, is mm. Christmas to Epiphany. Um, but anyway, so Epiphany, there's, like, all these rituals about it, uh, like like king cake, for instance. It's celebra a lot of times in Latin America, and they bake this cake, and they'll actually, like, bake in this little Jesus figurine into it and the thing is you all eat the cake together and try to find christ in this unexpected place that's sort of the theme is like seeking christ in all the unexpected places um and we saw that in jesus's life you know it's like if you wanted to find jesus would you go to the temple or were you going to go to where all the poor uh you know divorced widows were at the well um that idea and so i i and i think it's kind of ironic and sad that what we saw on January 6th, like this Christian nationalist uprising happened on Epiphany, um, because while there's Christian nationalists storming the Capitol, chanting, you know, Christ is king, um, it's that's like the exact opposite. That's almost, I guess, the expected place where they expected to find Christ was in like the seat of power and like them doing what they saw as the right thing, their crusade. Um, but I think it's important that, no, Christ is in the unexpected places hidden away uh, from those things. Um, and so I think there's sort I, I, you know, I, again, I don't believe in like super predestination or everything, but I think it's oddly fitting in some ways that that did happen on Epiphany. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that Christ was definitely not at that capital on that day. Ryan Lindsay, where can people find you? Where can they read you and follow your work? Uh, yeah, so I'm on face. My dogs are insane. That's okay. Um, it's, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> barely here. Oh, good. My, uh, so I'm on Facebook, uh, just Ryan Lindsay. I'm eating a big slice of pizza in my profile picture. Um, uh, I have uh, a Medium account where I write every once in a while uh it's just uh medium.com slash ryan e lindsey if you want to keep up with that with an a or an e in lindsey oh e l-i-n-d-s-e-y okay. um the uh scottish way to spell it I, think. <laughs> I will and i'll put a link in the show notes too so people can grab it at the website okay yeah um yeah that's that's i i 
I lurk in the in the Walnuts group for as long as that's still on Facebook you, or you seem to have uh like I don't know, have you changed like you know, have you gone from like pre election you were just on fire like you know, Lib Sock and now you seem like you've moderated a little bit. Have has has the last like I mean, I know that the last four months for me has changed. The, the last year changed a lot of things and made me reevaluate a lot of stuff. But like the last two months, three months has made me go, uh, I need to rethink everything. <laughs> and I don't yes. know. I, I get a different I get a different tone from you in the last like month than maybe six months ago. Yeah, no, I think um, well, I think everything with. I think especially COVID uh, just made me realize, like, obviously, you know, libertarians don't want a lot of these government institutions to exist, but if they don't exist or if they don't function well and there's not suitable replacements, like, lots of people can get hurt and die. Uh, yeah. so, it's, it, so it's emphasized the importance of institutions to me. Um, and then I think just the last since the election and like Trump's whole efforts to, you know, overthrow the election and especially January 6th and everything just really drove home to me like democracy is extremely fragile. Like, you know, Benjamin Franklin's quote about a republic, like you have a republic if you can keep it. And it's like I feel like everybody's kind of taken that for granted. Like, no, we're a democracy. We're we're a republic. Like that's what we are. It's what we always will be. But it's like nope doesn't have to be that way so um yeah the the importance of institutions and democratic norms have really been driven home to me um so i, I still consider myself like you know libsock uh and all but definitely less of a you know burn it all down to the ground i'm gonna laugh <laughs> i'm gonna laugh uh when you become a liberal democratic capitalist like myself uh, so it's going to be hilarious. I'm just someday you'll be a, a DSA or with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ryan Lindsay, thank you so much for joining <laughs> me here on the Chris Spangle Show. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. And we will talk to you soon.